Thank you, Kenny. Beautiful job. Welcome to Heritage Bible Church. We're so glad you're here. And we are starting our worship this morning with our scripture reading. So would you join Sandy as she comes forward and begins our service this morning by reflection of Psalm 115.
service that you are blessed that our hearts and minds would be focused on the person of Jesus Christ we'd be open to whatever you have for us and may our hearts continue to worship you we pray in the name of Jesus Amen. our ushers come forward and while they're coming forward let's join together in a prayer that unites us all. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.
Good morning again, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see your smiling face. We continue to grow and we continue to see God work in great ways. And I hope you're experiencing God each and every week that you come here. I hope that God not only speaks to you through His Word, but through the love that each and every one of us extend to each other. And if you don't feel that, we'll, we'll try to spread the peanut butter just a little bit thicker next week, okay? And we want to make sure that you're feeling the love, all right? And as we do that, I want to ask us to join our hearts together. Um, again, every week I'm going to try to bring something that focuses our thoughts and minds on prayer. And so I'll put a picture up every now and then just to kind of do that for us. And um, please join with me. Father, again, we acknowledge your presence. We're so thankful that the Spirit of God dwells in us. We're excited to be here. And we pray that your attendance, that you would be the one that's honored. Lord, the distractions in our hearts and our minds, the worries, the concerns, the things that we're going to be doing later on today or even this week, the events of this past week, may we just have those things put on hold right now so we can hear from you. Jesus, we're grateful for your work for us that you're interceding for us right now, even as we pray to you. You're praying for us. And the Spirit of God is interceding for us even when we don't know what to say. What a treasure. So Lord, whatever the Spirit of God is praying for each and every one of us, we say amen to you. Watch over my words. And may we hear, Lord, what you want us to hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you like to wait? How about the grocery line? You see, all these workers, and if you worked in a grocery store, I had, I had. But if, you worked, if, you, if, if you've been to a grocery store and you see six people in line and there's only one lane open, and there's three or four people in the background looking at the line, and they still go, hey, how you doing? How was your weekend, right? And they're talking to their coworkers instead of doing what? Hello, open up another line. There's six people in line. We hate the wait, right? Or how about, how about ooh, this, this one, the second red light in an intersection that you have to wait through, <laughs> right? Does that drive you crazy? I know some people, that it used to drive me crazy because the people just don't pay attention. But now I just go, okay, well, we'll get there when we get there, right? And this one's too easy. It's an easy target, but I'll mention it anyways. How about the DMV? How, how many people love hanging out at the DMV all afternoon, right? I mean, you go there to have a cup of coffee with your best friend, right? It's going to be an all-day excursion. We might as well enjoy it, right? I mean, that's the way it is. We hate we really hate the wait. But why do we hate the wait, right? We hate the wait. Oh, I'm going to get ahead of myself here. I had to change slides today, so my slides are a little bit out of order. But why do we hate the wait? I did an unscientific research on Facebook, right? And I think, I don't know, it was like 23 or 24 people that responded to my question. But I think this is pretty fair. Why don't we like the wait? Well, 38% of those questions said they don't like the uncertainty or the unknown. Some people said it's the waiting that's the hardest part of waiting. Thank you, Tom Petty. 19% said it was the anticipation or anxiety. Well, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm, I'm anxious about that. I'm anticipating it. And, and there, were two, there was, a, actually, that should be 10%, not 9, those two, last two ones. Um, they said, well, you know, I'm resisting the urge to do it myself. When you're waiting on people and you have that urge, you just, maybe I'll just go ahead and do it myself because I know they'll do it wrong, or I'll have to go back around and do it all over again. 
Or another person said, I, I'm thinking, as I'm waiting for something, I'm thinking about all the other things I could be doing. You know, that's when you create your grocery list at the DMV, right? And then another 10% said, uh, lack of control or trusting that God is in control. Well, let's back up here and see what happened. Because we've got, we got a news alert. Every week we bring, up, bring us up to date with Abraham. And so this is one of those news flashes that come up when you're, when you're um, watching the news, right? And so after Genesis 15 is Genesis 16, in case you were wondering. Just, just, you know, it's a hard one. But Abram and Sarai decide not to wait for God's plan. And God's plan was what? To have a child that would come through them. But if you remember in Genesis 15, it just says, Abraham, you're going to be a father. So, like we do, we try to figure out God's plan, don't we? We think, well, hmm, how can this work out? Well, then in walks Hagar, who happens to be Sarah's handmaiden, if you will. And Sarah goes, oh, that, I'm past childbearing. Of course this is God's plan. And so, Sarai encourages Abraham to go, it must be through Hagar. So in, the, in these days, I know it sounds weird to us in our 21st century, but in those days, if the lineage could be passed down through that, it was okay for someone to have relations with another woman in the house to create a lineage. And so uh, Abraham and Hagar go on a weekender, and um, they... Um, they all of a sudden they have Ishmael. I'm sorry if that offends you. I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to. And the, but the weird thing about Genesis 16 is after this happens, the house is divided. Sarai and Hagar start doing this because Hagar throws it in Sarai's face that she was pregnant, and Sarai couldn't get. Now, ladies, I know you never have that problem with competition. Guys definitely don't have that problem with competition, do we, guys? But it happens on either, either gender, doesn't it? And all of a sudden, Abraham's got a hot mess in his house. There is division and dissension all over the place. So that's the update on Abraham. But um, what happens when we don't wait on the Lord? Now, I'm just going to pull these out. I'm not going to read them. They're there for your edification. But in chapter 16, when he has Hagar, and when he has Ishmael through Hagar, what happens is they stop believing God's promise that he was going to father a child through Sarai. Sarai created their own path through Hagar. For 10 years, they were waiting for God to work. How long would you wait? Remember last week, he was about 83-ish. Now he's 93, and all of a sudden he goes in, or actually, actually 83, and the, uh, Ishmael's born, and we're going to find out 16 years later is where we're at today. And what happens is we watch our watches instead of God. We set God's plan to our calendar, to our time system, instead of God's time system. And that's a problem when we don't wait on the Lord. <laughs> We create unnecessary conflicts, as I mentioned. And sometimes those are generational conflicts. You've heard of the Hatfields and McCoys. Well, this is the Israelites and the Arab conflict that, we ju that Abraham just created here. Is that just a small problem on our global situation right now? Just a small problem. That all started here. And has that calmed down at all? Has that been resolved? Everyone's getting along, playing nice in the sandbox? Not on your life. So when we don't wait on the Lord, it can have generational consequences. By the way, did you know there was a Hatfield and McCoy quarrel up in Young, Arizona? Different names. Different names. It wasn't Hatfield and McCoy. But it was two different families. And you know what they argued over? One family owned sheep, and the other family owned what? Cattle. And why did they not get along? Because the sheep eat right down to the bone. 
or ground in this case. Cows can't get to that. They die off. There's literally a museum in Young, Arizona on one of the family's properties that still has the rifle slots in the house from where this feud happened. It's a great trip. If you ever, if you ever want a, an excursion, go to Young, Arizona. It's a great excursion. It's, it's in the middle of nowhere, but it's a beautiful little excursion to take. Anyways, I digress. So, as we're learning today, the detour, right? The problem, the problem with taking our own way and not waiting on the Lord is we find out that the detour is always worse than the main road. When I moved out here to Arizona, um, I was, uh, first of all, in 1986, I moved to New Mexico. And I was going to be a counselor at a church camp. And I was on I-25 coming down from Denver because I had a cousin living in Denver. And I came down I-25 through Santa Fe and things like this. And then I cut west on I-40 towards Vanderwagen, New Mexico, which is just south of, um, yeah, there's my brain. Just, oh, no, it's west of Albuquerque. It's, anyways, it's right there on the border. And it's Gallup, thank you. Give that gal a cookie. Can someone give her a cookie right now? Thank you for saving me. Just south of Gallup, about 20 minutes. But before I did that, there was a, there was a shortcut between I-25 and 40. And it was a little red line on my map. This is way before GPS. Way before GPS. And I thought, wow, I could cut off some time. I could cut off some, uh, 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 I could cut off some uh, uh, mileage. And it was getting late. The sun was beginning to set. And I, this is the first time I've been west of the Mississippi, let alone west of Ohio where I grew up. And so I take this little red line on the map, and by the time I'm done, I am traveling through this dirt pasture road that is full of potholes and sinkholes and anything else you can imagine. And I'm thinking, good night, Lord, what did I get myself into? I should have waited, and I should have just kept on the main road, but I found myself getting into a hot mess on my own driving and my own excursion. Eventually I got back on 40 and I never took another detour again. Because I learned. And now I was all by myself doing all this. And it was, I was, I'll be in that, I was scared for a moment. And my, my, my parents see this video because they watch the video every week. She, my mom said to go, I never do that. <laughs> it's okay, mom, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> Anyways, so what happened is Abraham forgot the equation, E plus R equals O. You know what that equation means, right? Right? Your, your experience plus your response equals the outcome. Your experience plus your response equals the outcome. And Abraham forgot that there's consequences when we respond inappropriately, when we don't wait on the Lord. This, this formula works on everything. It works in your marriage. It works in your family. It works in your business. It works in the relationships you have here at Sagewood. And it is a it is a universal formula. And it basically just means cause and effect. And don't forget, when you respond to an experience, that becomes an outcome. And that outcome becomes someone's experience. Right? And what happened to Abraham? His experience was wait on the Lord. How did he respond? He went ahead of God's game plan. The outcome? Global and generational conflicts between the Israelites and the Arabs. But we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about this thing, waiting on God. And the dictionary describes waiting as simply this, to remain inactive or a state of repose, to postpone or delay. But is that the biblical understanding of what waiting means? Actually, the biblical understanding, as we're going to find out in a few minutes, it means to wait for To wait for, to long for, to wait or look eagerly for. In the New Testament, the word hope is looked, waiting is, is kind of turned into hope there, and it means anticipation with expectation. Let me say that again. It's an anticipation with expectation. Does that sound passive? Does that sound like this definition? So when we see words in our Bible, it behooves us to go, yes, look it up in a dictionary, but sometimes we have to go, but is there something more? 
And that's where a good study Bible comes in, and that's where some other uh, tools can come in. And with the things available on the internet today, it's almost impossible not to understand. But biblical waiting is more of an anticipation. In fact, you see it here in Psalm 40. He says, the psalmist says, um, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see it and fear it, and will put their trust in the Lord. Waiting allowed other people to witness this psalmist go through some very hard times. And by them watching that psalmist go through some hard times and waiting on the Lord, look what happened. Other people put their faith and trust in the Lord. Again, experience plus response equals outcome. And an outcome is someone else's experience. It's a beautiful thing. And that's what happened. But getting back to Abraham, how do we, how do we wait on God? And the big idea that we're talking about today is We'll discover the benefits of waiting. I mean, that's what we're we'll gonna be talking about in a minute. By surrendering our agenda, or oh, did I say that? By surrendering our agenda to God's. Wait a minute, we're Americans, we have our own agenda. I got here by my own agenda. You're asking me to surrender my agenda, Paul? Yeah. Because what we find out from the life of Abraham is when we try to seize God's agenda with our own agenda and overlay our agenda on top of God's, we've already seen what happens to Abraham. That was one crazy house with all the conflicts. And again, we see the conflicts still remaining today. So what are some of the benefits? Well, number one, when we, we'll discover the benefit of waiting by surrendering our agenda for God's plan. What do we mean by that? In Genesis 17, 1 through 8, it says, now when Abraham was 99 years old, now it's 13 years, 16 years later, since Ishmael. Ishmael is about 13, 14 years old. And he, now the Lord comes back to him. We could stop there and preach a message. But here's something to observe. It was 16 years of silence between Abraham and God. When Ishmael was born, I'm sorry, I keep saying 16. 14 years of silence. Wow. One mistake caused a breach of 13, 14 years between God and Abraham. Were those dark days? Those are hard days. Do you ever go through an experience where God just seems absolutely Deaf to your requests and your prayers. Where every time you pray, you just you, you, you sense the words going boink and coming right back down and hitting and shattering on the ground. Anybody else been there? 16, there I go again, 13 to 14 years of silence. All of a sudden, I don't know if there was a knock on the door or, or what it was, but the Lord appears before Abraham and he says, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you and I'll multiply you exceedingly. Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name, I'm sorry, Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I'll make nations of you. And kings will come forth from you. I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you. Throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. To be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings. All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Did you see all the I wills in that text? I will, I will, I will. My covenant, my covenant, my covenant. God, when he, when we surrender our agenda to God's plan, number one, be ready for being challenged. He challenges Abraham by saying, walk before me 
and be blameless. We're going to talk about that a little bit more, but let me just say this. When we're walking with the Lord and His plan, and He tells us to be blameless, that word means to be single-minded. It doesn't mean perfect. It just means to be single-minded, to be focused. Right? My dad used to say, get your head out of the clouds. Get your head in the game, get it out of the clouds. Be focused. And when you make that decision, the root word of decide means to cut. <coughs> Meaning you're saying yes to this and no to everything else. And Abraham is being challenged by saying, by, by God, saying you need to cut away everything you think is the plan and really listen to the plan. And sometimes we need to hear that from God. It, it's not punishment. It's just a strong reminder that God is God. He's in the heavens, like Sandy read today. He's in the heavens. He does what he pleases. So be prepared to be challenged. God takes his name pretty seriously as well. He calls himself El Shaddai. This is the first time that this term, God Almighty, is mentioned in the Bible. It means God, El Shaddai, which means God Almighty, God in his providence and in his control, does whatever he wants, when he wants, because he's God and he's in charge. And he's challenging Abraham to listen. And he's giving more of who he is to Abraham to help him understand that he's really in control. God takes his word seriously, his name seriously. God also changes our perspective when we surrender our plan to his Notice he changed Abram's name from Abram, which means exalted father, to Abraham, father of multitudes. Father of multitudes. The name change. And God sometimes has to take us outside and give us a different perspective. And he did that by changing his name. And when we surrender our agenda to God's plan, God's plan is forever. It never goes out of style. He said, this is going to be throughout all generations. So we discovered a benefit of waiting by surrendering our agenda to God's. But there's more. I was like an info workshop. Wait, there's more. But we'll discover the benefits of waiting by surrendering our agenda, not only to God's plan, but God's way. Abraham and Sarah were trying to figure out their own way through Ishmael and Hagar. And God said, wait a minute, that, that's not the way. In verses 9 through 14, we don't have time to go through all that, but let me just bring out some highlights. God's way is much different from our ways. Isaiah 55, 8 says this. God's ways are so much different than ours. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's way, God's plan is so much different than ours. Who would have thought that Sarah and Abraham at the age of 90 and 100 would have conceived a child? It sounded foolish back then when they lived 175, 180 years age. Some of them lived eight, 900 years, Methuselah. It sounded foolish then. How much more does it sound foolish today? But God did it. God provided the plan because he's God Almighty. God is in the heavens. Right, Sandy? He does whatever he pleases. I love it. Isn't that great comfort that God's plan and God's way is going to get done? We just need to hold on and wait with Anticipation and expectation. But God's way is not only different from ours. God's way calls us to commitment. This is where he challenges Abraham and says, the sign of the covenant, not the means of your salvation, Abraham, but the sign of your salvation is through circumcision. And God did this to show, to have Abraham show his commitment level to God. And today, we, we, we don't, as a church, we don't mandate people get circumcised. But our sign of commitment, of our devotion to Christ, is through baptism. 
And when we do that, we're saying no to ourselves and our plan and yes to God's plan. That whole picture of being baptized, of being immersed into the water and coming back out is a picture of Christ dying with Christ in the burial and being raised with him to new life. That's the picture of our commitment with Christ. But we'll not only discover the benefit of surrendering our agenda to God's way and God's plan, I mean, sorry, God's plan and God's way, but in verses 15 through 22, it's in God's time. God's plan, God's way, God's time. God's plan, God's way, God's time. If we can get that down, that will save us a lot of headaches. And it was something that Abraham missed. But he's teaching us today. What do we mean by God's time? Well, he says right here in, um, in verses 15 through 22, Abraham says, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, No. But Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son. Notice he's getting more specific. First it was, you're going to have a son. Now God clarifies it and says, Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. God even had his name picked out. By the way, Isaac means what? He laughs. It means he laughs. Wouldn't it make you laugh if you found out someone you knew that was 90 years old turned up pregnant? What? <laughs> I mean, that's just the natural ex expression, right? you got to be kidding me. And you can imagine the neighbors of Abraham and Sarah. What? Sarah's pregnant? <laughs> I mean, it'd be hilarious. And God names them that way. He's laughing. But notice the timing. He says, um, But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. Fourteen years after the promise we studied last week. Fourteen years. Fourteen years. Abraham waited. Imagine waiting 14 years in a DMV. Mm. I need medication. <laughs> right? I would need serious medication. 14 years. God's timing. God's plan. God's way. God's time. And when that time comes through, when we're waiting, God sometimes has to clear our mind. Remember, he cleared it up. He says, no, 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 it's not Hagar. It's not through Ishmael. It's through Sarah. And she's going to bear you a son. Because sometimes we get confused not waiting for God's timing. It's also not only an influence on Abraham, but there was an influence with Sarah. Because God not only changed Abraham, Abram's name to Abraham, he changed Sarai's name to Sarah. Guess what Sarai means? Contentious. Divisive. Guess what Sarah means? That's my daughter. Her name is Sarah. It means princess. Princess. And see, that's the thing we have to remember. Even when we blow it, even if we fail waiting on God, he still tells us how he views us. There's no finger of condemnation here. There's no looking down on anyone's noses. He calls Abraham the father of a multitude. He calls Sarai, Sarah, the princess. God sees us so much differently. Even after we blow it, he still sees us as the people of God that we are. And he loves to tell us that. I hope that's sinking in. You may have blown it by not waiting on God. Both my hands are up on that one, okay? But God doesn't look at us from our mistakes. He looks at us from who we are in his sight. And the precious children that you are in the sight of God. Please let that sink in. Dr. 
found the pulpit, I would, but I don't, I don't have a pulpit. Please let that sink in. <laughs> when we discover the benefits of waiting, we surrender our agenda to God's plan, God's way, and God's timing. God's timing, it's never late. It's rarely early. But Ed, Ed help me finish this line. God is often just in time. Just in time. I worked for a machine shop back in the 80s during the Reagan era. And we worked, oh man, it was great. We could work all the overtime in the world, not even have to ask permission. It was beautiful. Because I was 18 years old, and I was going through money like crazy. And I could work all the overtime. But we had these certain parts that we called just in time. They couldn't be made until they were ready just in time. And it had to be made. And sometimes we had to hurry and get through. And sometimes there were delays, which caused some headaches. But a lot of times, some of the parts that we made were just in time. Some of the materials that we received were just in time. God's plan, God's way, God's time is just in time. He knows the right time. He knows when this is going to need to be happening. He's the grand architect. He's the conductor. If we're the orchestra, he's the conductor. And he calls us in when our part is needed. And then he silently asks us to wait for our turn. And he brought, brings out the other instruments. And it's a beautiful piece when God is in control. And we allow him and we surrender our agenda to him. So what are some benefits? Well, number one, we discover more about God. We've already talked about this. It, uh, um, God, all, God Almighty means El Shaddai, God Almighty. We've already talked about that. His name means God Almighty. It's the first mention of this, and it means that God does what he wants, when he wants, where he wants, how he wants. Number two, we've already talked about this, but we discover more about how God views us. We already talked about the name changes from Abram to Abraham, from Sarai to Sarah. Let me put this in here. We discover that God takes his word seriously. 30 times the word covenant is mentioned in this chapter 17. 30 times. There's 27 verses in this chapter. The word covenant is mentioned 30 times. There's 27 verses in this chapter, and God says, I will, 15 times. God takes his word seriously. And he wants us to take his word seriously as well. But we also learn what God asks of us in this passage. And that's to be single-minded and committed to his plan, his way, and his time. God's plan, God's way, God's time. God's plan, God's way, God's time. God's plan, God's way, God's time. That's what we learned from this. It's a beautiful picture of what happens. So when we look at waiting, waiting is all about living with a watchful expectation for God's plan, God's way, and God's time. Which means... We need to be single-minded about God's agenda. Not veering off the road and going, well, I, God's kind of tardy. <laughs> I think I'll do, I'll do it my own way. Waiting is all about living with watchful expectation. One more thing. Oops. One more thing. What agenda do you need to surrender to the Lord today? What agenda? I just watched a movie last night I've been trying to watch for weeks. And it's called Darkest Hour. Have you seen it? Anybody? It's a little, it's a little bit, a, a small segment of the early days of Prime Minister Winston Churchill. And it talks, it highlights the political enemies he had Talks about his own personal struggles in that. But 
when you see God's plan, God's way, and God's time with that man. I don't know if he was a believer in Christ or not. That's not the issue. God can use anybody. God's plan. It was the darkest hour of Europe when he became prime minister. Days right after he became prime minister, he was informed by his generals and admirals that Dunkirk was going on right now. And their troops, all this was the remaining troops that Britain had. 300,000 men, that's it, were being surrounded by German troops and they were pushing towards the beach where their men were at. Imagine taking over a country and having this thrown at you and what you do. God's plan. Put Churchill in place. God's way. His tenacity and his courage to face his political enemies to face Hitler himself and say, we will never surrender in his famous speech, Parliament. God's timing. God put him there at the right place, at the right time, to save Europe, to hold off the barbaric nation led by a guy who should have been killed a long time ago. Hold it off until the Allies can get involved. I tell you, if you've never studied Churchill, you see God's plan, God's way, and God's time. We'll never be Churchills. No one's asking to be a prime minister. But you know what? God's asking you to put aside your agenda to his plan, to his way, to his time. He is God Almighty, and he will see the plan through. Trust <coughs> in him. Trust in him. And he, would you lead us?
we're singing out. It's a great song, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Appropriate, just a closer walk, Lord. That's what we ask for. The Apostle Paul to the, the church in Ephesus says this as our benediction. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly be all that we ask, beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. God bless you all. Please stick around for some fellowship, and um, we would love to have you do that. Uh, just a quick family announcement. There's a bulletin announcement in your bulletin about a family meeting next Sunday. Just a quick town hall. We'll meet about 15 minutes after the service is over. Gives us time to have some cookies and whatever else. We'll come back in here, and we have a small outline that's been distributed in your uh, bulletin. And we would love to have your input. If you're not going to be here, you can write a question on the back of the, that slip of paper and hand it to one of the leaders. Um, or you can email it to one of us as well. Whatever's easier for you. If you want to think about your question, you can think about that. But bring your input. We'd love to hear from you. That's what we look forward to. It's an open town hall meeting. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week a week where you're enjoying God's plan, God's way, God's time.
face it off. The first one, I mean, this is the first one to think of. Make you something like that. It'll be, it'll be more likely. Yeah. Because some of them are, are you know, you're not going to do something like that. Yeah. And all, the, 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 you can pass, if you can send them faster, they, they have the best words. To, right. When they have a word every day, every beat. Right. Oh, there he comes. I really enjoy your piano. Thank you so much. <laughs> Set this up. I'm going to play a solo, trumpet solo. Uh -huh. uh, here today? Well, it is going to practice. practice? Uh, Would it be possible to move the piano? Sure, it rolls very easily. Is it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. Let me get all this split up here. Just roll it back. Just kind of back that way. Yeah, no problem.
Then it's got, yeah. Sticking around for music, huh? Yeah. Oh, the tree. 